Greetings to baristas. So another diatribe on Israel is of? Yes, because its values and views have become so much a part of U.S. policy, foreign and domestic, that we can speak of the Israelization of America. This includes not only the government's attitude toward the Middle East, toward its place in the world, but also increasingly toward its own citizens. Now, by this, I'm not indulging in some asinine European conspiracy tradition of the Jews control the world system. It's true that a highly placed Jewish American neocons in state and academia do advocate the spread of American empire as a security shield for Israel to pursue its interests through the likes of the Potteridge clan of John, William, and Norman, Irving Crystal, Robert Kaplan, and the staff of Commentary Magazine, as well as their counterparts in APAC, the American Israel Political Action Committee. But like other interest groups of this nature, such as the Cuban American National Foundation, when it comes to Cuban or Latin American affairs, they have no more influence than the U.S. government allows them to have. The tail does not wag the dog. If the U.S. government is following the advice of such persons, it's because their agenda serves the interests of the American establishment in furthering its grasp on world power. U.S. policy in the Middle East has always been dominated by oil, by oil corporations and influential oil men in public and private life. Israel has been subsidized by the U.S. military-industrial complex as an outpost of Western power for that reason, in what has long been a very open and volatile region. Thirty years ago, that was even more so than it is now, with the Soviet Union jockeying for its share of the regional goodies. There was no one in the Arab and Muslim world, especially after the fall of the Shah, but really before as well, who could be counted on to be 100% on the Western side of this great power struggle game. The interests of the U.S. and Israel dovetailed so perfectly that they have more than converged, they have in fact fused. In foreign doings, this is seen in the wholesale adoption of American hostility toward Arabs and Islam. I can remember when Arabs were regarded with patronizing good humor, as in Ahab the Arab, Sheik of the Burning Sands, the Rudolph Valentino stereotype, the legacy of Lawrence of Arabia, the Peter O'Toole film of the same name, were dominant. How did this positive, if patronizing image, change from wholesale demonization of Arabs and Muslims as terrorists, pure and simple? The great dividing line was, of course, 1967. It's rare to find anything positive concerning Arabs or Muslims in Western popular culture after that date. The Six-Day War of the Spring of 1967, subsidized by American power, reinforced Israel as the safe bet for projecting American power in that region. Thus, Israel's enemies became America's enemies. It's fight, America's fight. Lawrence of Arabia was replaced with the ragged terrorist, and the U.S. media was saturated with Abu Nadal, Yasser Arafat, Muammar Gaddafi, the Ayatollah Khomeini, all painted in the most lurid colors to push the mass hot button of xenophobia and racism. But didn't those ragged assholes deserve a dissolve? Didn't they engage in terrorism, in acts that finally claimed the most sacred form of life on the planet, that is, American life? Only, it's the U.S. fusion of itself with Israel that has brought the wars of the Middle East home to the U.S., from hostage-taking in Iran to the mass murder of 9-11. Interesting, as a side note, when the Chechen wars broke out in Russia, our Cold War pundits couldn't decide whether to roll their eyes or shit. That is, to demonize the Russian evil empire and hail the Chechens as noble freedom fighters and warriors like the Afghan Mujahideen, or demonizing the Chechens as Islamofascists. Even when the U.S. has used Islamic fundamentalism to push its agenda, as in Afghanistan and even in Iran a long time ago, it's the identification with Israel's jihad on the Middle East that has prevented any sustainable relationship with the region, one that is so vital for the Western system. Under that circumstance, it leaves little room for other than a military colonial relationship. If Israelis' mindset or the attitude of Israelis have been adopted to serve American power interests in the Middle East, its attitudes, their attitudes have also embraced the rights of Middle Easterners and Muslims at home. While it might be true that Arabs and Muslims have more formal rights in Israel and the U.S. than in Syria or Iran, the true measurement is their enjoyment of these rights relative to the majority population. We hear a lot about how Israeli Arabs enjoy the same legal rights of Jews uh, to vote, to use public entitlements, to serve in the army. But the reality is that these rights are qualified and even denied when security requirements deem these restrictions necessary, as they always have in Israel. Arabs and Muslims in Israel have always been seen as a fifth column, an enemy in the midst, to be surveilled and co-opted and excluded, if necessary, from the full rights of equal citizenship, which many feel they are simply not entitled to in a self-proclaimed Jewish state. I'll let you draw the parallels with elsewhere, but it has a self-serving logic, given the state of war between Israel and the Islamic world. But as regards the United States, there was no reason to adopt this attitude except for the Israelization of its attitude toward the Middle East. 
If you think 9-11 caused the hatred of Muzzies in the USA, think again. Even before the kidnapping of American hostages at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran in 1979, the neocons in AIPAC were flooding the American media with images of bloodthirsty Arab terrorists financed by the Soviet Union to destroy Western civilization, and the American establishment was encouraging this imagery at every step. Carter was damned for his Camp David Accords as an appeaser of terrorism before any of the so-called benchmarks in American attitudes were realized. Muslims in the Western world were paying the price for this backlash at a time when globalization was making increased immigration possible and necessary for so many. But it's not just the Muslims and Arabs in Israel and the West who have been sacrificed in the name of securing civilization. The average Israeli lives in a national security state dominated by xenophobia, increasingly ruled by fanatic fundamentalists of its own kind, where the average citizen's rights come second to the security needs of the state and those who own it. Just as in the USA, where Mayor Bloomberg can't really see the difference between the 9-11 terrorists and the Occupy Wall Street movement. Like the PLO and Peace Now in Israel, they're all perceived as on the same side, that is, against the power and privilege of those who rule, and increasingly treated the same. To prevent terrorism, it's not just mosques and student Islamic associations put under surveillance. It's everyone and everything they do and say. As I said in an earlier video, you can't walk the streets of New York without invisible eyes, some not so invisible, following you over the whole city. The excuse? 9-11, of course, because it justified a silent coup d'etat by the American security apparatus to make suspects and subjects of the entire civil population. Those who conduct security always believe they know best how security should be conducted, and on whom, and are left free from democratic checks and balances in the name of public safety. As in Israel, so in New York, so in the U.S., so in the West in general. So, how to get out of this trap? Let's make a new beginning by, say, not intervening in Syria, directly or indirectly. The Syrian people don't want outside intervention, but Israel does, the United States does, to further establish regional dominance in one more place. Let's begin this change, of course, by respecting their right of self-determination where it starts, by settling their own affairs, not repeating the wrongs done in Iraq, flexing imperial muscles to bring them freedom and democracy while cursing them as sand niggers. Well, who's this on the YouTube line? Hello? Who? Meyer Kahani, founder of the Jewish Defense League and the Koch Party in Israel. What brings your voice from that great Zion and the beyond? Uh, just want these viewers to know that all of these leaders are only thinking what you were always saying. That's what you always said about Jewish leadership in Israel and the U.S. But I'm referring also to American and Western leaders. Oh, that is who you mean, too. And underneath all the rhetoric of Madeleine Albright and Condoleezza Rice, Irving Kristol, Hillary Clinton, Henry Kissinger, Dick Cheney, we find you or your spirit. Come on, that's as unreasonable as saying that Hitler's shadow stood behind Helmut Kohl.